I'm, I'm Delane Fitzgerald, the head football coach here at Frostburg. Um, I'd like to thank the leadership committee for allowing me to come speak. I was flattered when they uh, sent out the invitation and asked me to do this. It took Avalon, Avalon and I a couple times back and forth before we could understand each other. Um, so that, that was interesting. And then after I accepted, I put my hands in my head and thought, oh no, what have I done to myself? Because now I have to get ready and talk about this. Um, but, but it was good. Um, Avalon asked me to speak on team leadership strategies. And then more specific, he let me know that he wanted to talk about the nurturing of, of a team. So I, I took a month, month uh, five weeks, and, and put together notes and stuff uh, about the nurturing of, of, of a team and team leadership and just kind of put some of the stuff on paper here. I looked up definitions of team leadership and found about 100 of them. And, and it was the same 20 words worded in different ways. Uh, but, but the one that I really liked was providing guidance and motivation to a group of people for the purpose of achieving results. I, I thought that one was really, really good. Um, for me to talk about the, the 12 things, the 12 leadership strategies that our football program has and that I have as the leader of the football program, I wanted you guys to kind of understand some of the things that we inherited here. When we got here in 2014, they had been 1-9. One and nine. Uh, one and nine football team. Our current senior kicker had hit a 47-yard field goal in a rainstorm here at home against Case Western to keep them from being 0-10. So they were this close to being unsuccessful on the field for that entire year. Um, when we walked into the room, I, I, saw, I saw lost souls. I saw young men that didn't believe in themselves. Um, I, I saw a lot of disorganization within our players. So we started with some of those things. I think to be a team leader, self-evaluation is extremely important. And one of the things I did, you know, when I got here was evaluate myself. That things that I'm, I'm poor at as a leader, organization, not great there. Um, Professional dress, I struggle with that, so y'all understand this isn't me. I'm, I'm a blue jeans and t-shirt guy. I love work boots, blue jeans and a t-shirt. Technology, something I'm working really, really hard with. Patience. Uh, patience is something that I struggle with because I expect our players to be really, really good, really, really fast. In other words, when their parents drop them off at the dorm the first day, I expect them to be good from then on. Um, I coach loud, something that I have to work on every day. The best thing that ever happened to me with yelling at players is God gave me two daughters. So my two daughters prevent me from yelling at them as much as I used to when I was younger. Um, expectations, and going back to the patience things, I have real high expectations for our players. And then my willingness to learn. Um, and, I, and I'll go back to talk about it being a strength later on, but that's one of my weaknesses. Going into uh, to my strengths and self-evaluation and, and discipline, uh, accountability, punctuality, toughness, mental and physical toughness, persistence, selflessness, loyalty, and a positive attitude. So when we got here in, in 2014, we, we started with building our coaching staff and our players around the things that I did well. And it naturally, in, in, in hiring people and in bringing players in, they're going to bring their natural strengths in. But some of the stuff that was out on the surface, we wanted them to match what we did as a staff and kind of there. And then the last thing here is, I go, well, one of my favorite quotes, just heard it recently, and now I say it to myself three times a day, what kind of team would we be if everyone acted like me? And me saying that to myself two, three, four times a day puts me in my place. But, but what, type, what kind of team would we be if everybody, the, the assistant coaches and the players, acted exactly like me? And, and, and it, it humbles me and puts me in my place. Getting into the handout that, that you guys have um, as, as a leader, team leadership strategy number one, know where you're going. Provide a clear vision, goals, and expectations. Provide a clear vision, goals, and expectations of where you're going. I, I think it's the first, the first thing you need to do, and it's important. And then I love little catchy quotes. The difference in a good leader and an average leader is knowing what you want and then knowing what the end result looks like. When we got here, we talked to our players immediately about exactly what we want and vision for year one. And we go with our visions, goals, and expectations, usually go year to year. But we talked with them to give them something they can see. And our vision was this. We want to line up 10 Saturdays next fall and be competitive. Line up and be competitive. Be ready to play and give your heart and soul for three hours. We want you to go to class every single day. We talk with them every week about the, 
you, you've paid this money. You're, you're, you're paying between fifteen and thirty thousand dollars a year to, to be at Frostburg State University. Take advantage of it. We expect you. Our vision is that you go to class every day. We talked with them about our vision for GPA, which is the 3.0. But we provide, I'm, I'm giving you a couple of examples. There are probably 12. But our performance vision for them was that we were competitive, that we were going to go out and compete for three hours every Saturday, and that you have to compete during the week too in practice. And then our academic goal for them was that they were going to attend every class every day of the week. We were going to attend study hall five nights a week, and they were going to get a 3.0 GPA. So we provided clear goals and expectations there. Moving down to number two, if you're a team leader, you want to make sure you don't fake it. Uh, don't fake things. Um, be honest. One of the problems I made as a young head coach that I, that I try no longer to ever make is that when people ask you something, don't be afraid to say you don't know. But when I was younger and stuff, I would, I'd make up something rather than tell somebody I don't know. And, and now a couple of years later, it, a player or an assistant walks in my office every day and asks me something that I have no idea. My response is almost always the same. I don't know. Would you give me a couple hours and I'll go get the answer for you? Give me a day and I'll go ahead and get the answer for you. But make sure, make sure you're not faking things. Number three, if, if you're a team leader, group leader, any, any of your department head, go with your strengths. And, and, and I, th I thought mine were discipline, accountability, punctuality, toughness. Persistence, selflessness, loyalty, and a positive attitude. And we have, I have over and over and over just gone with those. Those seven or eight things just over and over tried try to build a team and build an environment around our football program with those strengths. Um, as a team leader, you've got to be completely committed. If you're not completely committed, it goes back to the, you're faking it. And the people that you're, that you're with and around, they're going to see it. That They'll see that you're faking it and then they'll fake things. Um, be, be completely committed to what you're doing. Again, with the catchy quotes, uh, keep the winners and get rid of the whiners. And then and, and let the final part of that is stay committed to your vision. There are going to be bumps in the road. You're a team leader, group leader. There's going to be adversity. There's going to be challenges. Stay with your vision. If you believe in your vision and you're 100% committed to it, you'll stick to it. Eventually, it will be successful. Uh, number five, uh, work harder than those under you. Uh, it, it, it is a, um, it, I bolded the wrong thing, okay? And, and what it should have said is lead by example. Uh, lead, lead by example. Don't, don't, ask, don't ask those that work under you or work with you and stuff to do things that you wouldn't do. Um, demonstrate integrity. But, but lead by example. Uh, big, big one for me. Um, number six. Number six, be mentally, and, be, be mentally tough. Uh, be mentally and physically tough. Keep the pressure on. Demonstrate a sense of urgency within your team and within within what everyone's doing. Have a sense of urgency to get things done. I could jump down to number 12, but I'll talk about it later. Small goals. Small goals, small motivational things. Keep a sense of urgency week in and week out within your department and within your team. Um, but, but be tough. And then again, number six goes right back up to number four. And talk, talking about it back up to stay committed to your vision. But when, you, when you're mentally tough, uh, make sure you're staying the course. There, there's going to be things that pop up there. There always is. Stay the course with what you're doing. Uh, number seven, put, put team first. Okay, put your team first. Have pride in doing the best possible job that you can. But then when things go right, deflect attention to those around you. G give credit to every to everyone around you and those that are working with you and working for you. Give credit to them. But, but put the team first all the time. Team first, team first, team first. A lot of really, really successful college and pro head coaches, they'll, their motto, the team, the team, the team. You know, that, that, that's their coaching motto, their team and organizational motto. Well, what's best for the team? But, but put them first. Um, de deflect attention. I think it's part of my natural um, makeup when things go wrong, I, I'll just jump on the grenade. I'll jump on the grenade and take credit for whatever it is that went wrong. And then when things go right, I give, give it all, give it all to the players as much as possible. Number eight, um, build, building team spirit. Something that I thought when we got here in 2014 was lacking. But what was a team, university, state of Maryland, Frostburg, that there was a lack of a spirit. 
there, and, and we, we did a lot of things to kind of build stuff that, that they should be proud of. But team spirit, team spirit, team spirit. The best thing we do, team spirit, it lets our young guys know really, really earlier about the power, the, the, the power of we versus me and the power of working together. Um, explain why. I think this is a generational thing. I, I, I took a long time because my parents and grandparents raised me and it was a, a, a do, what I, do what I say, not what I do. And it was do what I say right now. If, if you're leading a team in this day and age, you need to explain why you're doing what you're doing. And, and oftentimes, you, you, to, to, to young people, you, you want to explain it on a daily basis. But if not daily, you want to explain weekly. We're, we're doing this and this this and this are exactly why we're doing it. If you can give them multiple reasons on why you do what you do, you, you can usually get full buy-in. But I thought explaining why was good. Number 10, act, do not react. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this is a, that, this, uh, you, that everyone can relate as a team leader with this. Um, the job of a team leader is to see what's around the corner, see what's down the road, and have your group prepared for it before you get there. If you're a team leader that just lets things happen and then you react, knee-jerk reactions, react however you want to term it, if you're just letting things happen and then you're reacting to it, you'll always be behind. You'll always be playing from behind, playing from behind. As a, a good team leader sees what's down the road, they see what's coming, and, and they fix it and prepare their group for it before they get to it. Uh, number 11, show you care. Um, have a sincere interest in team members outside of work. This is um, double-edged for me and, and ongoing and every single day. It gets a little longer than it was before. There, there's nine people here at the university currently that work under me and then we have 110 players as I speak. Our conference limit is 125. So come the second week in August every year there's 135 people. That I have to show a sincere interest in it, it, it becomes all it becomes daunting. It becomes almost impossible sometimes. Um, it get, getting into it even deeper and now that I'm, I'm in my 21st season college football. So so there's 21 graduating classes that I showed a sincere interest in as a young assistant, as a young head coach, and uh, now now it, I feel like an old head coach. So the baldness makes me look a little more like one. But, but there's, there's a lot of people that I have to show a sincere interest in. Give you a couple of examples. Two and a half months ago, I had a player, coached him seven or eight years ago. Got in a bad spot, nothing illegal, but, but got in a bad spot in Hollywood, Florida. And I got up from my apartment here, went to the Western Union, at food line in Western Union in money. Haven't seen him in five years. But for whatever reason, in his predicament, I was his guy. I was his go-to. And I firmly believe it was because of the sincere interest that I always showed him. Now, I don't have any problem giving him the money. may not ever see the money again. For four straight years, he went to every class, went to every study hall. And on Saturdays, he played his rear end off for us. He played really, really hard. So I don't think I owe him the, the money, but I have a sincere caring about him. Let those that you work with and those that, that you work over top of or oversee, let them know that you care. Actually, have a sincere Number 12. Number 12 should have been the entire 50-minute presentation for, for me. Um, I, I believe team leadership, group leadership, boils down to motivation. I think motivation is an hourly thing. I think it's a daily thing. I think motivation is a weekly thing. I, I think if you're a leader that, that walks in and goes to your office week after week after week and you're not motivating those around you, I, I think you're a really poor leader. I, I think you're doing a poor job at what you're doing. Um, but, but I think motivation and then a couple of them. Small motivation works. Small motivation is really, really good. Surprise motivation, it, it works. Um, make motivation involve pressure. Yeah, yeah. The, the motivation you're given is, is performance based. You, you want to motivate them to perform, motivate them to be better employees, motivate them to like work, motivate them to work 20 minutes longer than, than they would normally work. But, but you want the motivation to involve pressure. Celebrate small victories. So when, when, when things are small, uh, cel celebrate the small victories. It works. Um, use frequent feedback. Hey, give feedback on the motivation. If, if you're setting goals and you're setting all this stuff as motivational tactics, give feedback on exactly where you're at and how you're doing there. 
Create favorable conditions to ensure success works when you're just starting and you're bad. If you think you're bad at something or you think your group is bad at something, it creates favorable conditions. It gives give you one that's real, real easy. Uh, we, we take the job here. That the football program had been 1-9 and nine the year before we got here. Our first game was against Geneva. So Geneva's the worst team on our schedule. So it just naturally our schedule created a favorable condition <laughs> with which we could win our first game. Here's the staff. Create success and then use that success to build on future successes. We, we, we beat, um, any, anybody in here attend that game? Don't raise your hand. I know you are. <laughs> three, three lightning delays. Three lightning delays. Yes, uh, seven. We ran, went three plays. Went three plays, 33 minute lightning delay. Came back down and warmed up. 30 minute lightning delay. Came back down, ran a play. 30 minute lightning delay. I said, whoa, we're never going to play. And then after an hour, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but after an hour, hour and a half of lightning delays, we come in, first play we ran, went for a touchdown. <laughs> went, went for, but we, we, we beat Geneva that night, 25 to 19. We turn around the following week and go to Winchester and beat Shenandoah. And Shenandoah was probably two, three touchdowns better than us that fall. They're not now, but they were that fall. And then we turn, these are all schools that they had lost to the year before. And then we turn around and take a nine hour trip to Utica, New York, seven and a half hours on a bus, Utica, New York, and get off, and we've got the ball first and goal at the end of the football game with a chance to beat a team that they had lost to by 40 the, the year before. And we, we lost. We lost um, 20 to 13 to, to Utica. They went on, went to a bowl game, went 7 3, went to a bowl game. We used the Geneva success to help us have success against Shenandoah. We used the Shenandoah success to help us have success against Utica. We lost to Utica. But we gave the kids great feedback after the loss in order to motivate them through the rest of the season. Uh, number seven here, um, engage and excite your team with a shared vision. I play on with the young man, with the young men like sometimes. Um, but create a, an exciting and shared vision with, with your players. Talk to them about things you, you, you know they want to hear. I, I continuously, we're, we're six and four now. We're six and four now and returning eight players on offense and eight players on defense and things are favorable for us to be competitive again this fall. I talk with them about being the first program. Last year, the, the driving comment all the time, let's have the first winning season in 15 years. Let's win more than we lose for the first time in 15 years. Now, it's let's have the first back-to-back -back winning seasons in 15 years. And you can see when I say it to young men, they'll smile. They'll smile, but and everybody, department leaders, team leaders, all of your departments, your goals and motivations and visions and all that are going to be different. But you want to create something that's shared and something that excites everybody that, that, that's involved in it. Um, there you go. Your motivation that challenges and inspires. One more time and then I'll quit talking about it. I think you could talk for three straight days on motivation, different motivational techniques. And, and what they mean and how important they are. I think it's the most important thing that people do as a team leader. Motivation, if you want to make sure when you're motivating a team, motivating a group, make sure you appeal to their intrinsic motivation, to what's within in them. And, and you want to, it's not, it's, 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 it's okay to use extrinsic motivation, but it should be few and far between, it should be sparse. One more on, on the extrinsic that, that worked for us. 2014, our first season here, we were four, four homecomings. That's what people thought of us that were playing us. Last year, we were three, three people's homecomings. So again, kind of what, what they thought of us. Well, after going to one or two of the homecomings up in, up in New York, it's miserable, but, but after going to one or two of them and, and the big parade and all that stuff and the 25, 30 minute half times, I said, oh, we're not gonna do this. We're not gonna be people's homecoming queens. But we're not going to do it. So I announced to our players, from this point forward, until Coach Dell fires me, I said, every time we wreck somebody's homecoming, steak and baked potato on the way home. <laughs> we're eating steak and baked potato on the way home. And before it come out of my mouth, I realized, and right after it come out of my mouth, I realized I'd have made a mistake. If I'd have made a mistake, we haven't lost one come since. <laughs> yeah. I haven't lost one. You know, we go, we go to William Patterson this year, meet them by 30 on their homecoming. 
We go to Christopher Newport and meet them. Here, here's, here's the one that got me. We go to Christopher Newport and meet them. By the time they're home, we start at 7. By the time homecoming's over with, it's after 11. It's right at 11. We're getting into the locker room. It's 12 before we leave there. Where are my feet? I'm staking that. Anyway. You better believe they remember that. They remember. But it ca caused a bunch of um, logistics. It caused a bunch of logistic problems for me and for the coaching staff. Um, we've, won five, we've won five out of six homecomings, and we fed them five or we fed them four out of the five times, um, but but it's been interesting. Yeah, it, it, it became a pride thing. It was a lot of fun. I enjoy competing, so it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm about ten or fifteen minutes early. Any questions? Anything? Miss Kelly. Very good. Guys, thank y'all. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. I appreciate it.